internet's not working in the office. So, Laura, pretty much we'll talk about whatever you want to talk about because, hell, my slideshow presentations aren't able to be uploaded. So what you got for me? What, uh, what would uh, you like to talk about today? Um, let's see. I submitted an offer. It's I'm a I'm a newer agent. I know. I we met one time, didn't we? Yes, we did. <laughs> yeah. Um. So I, I guess I'm not new anymore, but this, I'm new to this transaction. I uh, have a buyer submitted an offer. Um. The agent told me that uh they went with that offer. I'm just waiting to receive the paperwork back. Nice. Um. Where do I go from here? <laughs> okay. So I was in this very same place as you a while back when I first came to New Jersey. I wasn't a new agent, but I was new to being an agent in New Jersey. Uh, new Jersey works a little bit differently. Than this. So you hear these terms like attorney review and you're like, okay, so the attorneys are involved and you're like, okay, but when do they get into the picture? And right. you, know, you have all these questions. So I had the same exact question mark in my mind that uh, you're probably having now. So I approached other agents and that's exactly what we're doing now. So, uh, so that's great. So you found them a home, you were able to come to uh, an agreement and now you're at the point where you're getting the um, agreement executed by the seller. Yes. All right. Okay. Mm -hmm. So at this point, they need to select an attorney, your buyers, All right? Do they have one selected or not, yet? not quite yet? Yes, they have an attorney. Okay, great. So as soon as you get a copy of the executed agreement, you're going to forward it to the attorneys. Okay. And they're, and they're going to begin what's called the attorney review period. And the attorney review period is the first uh, phase of the buying process, right? So we find, we find them right on the perfect time. Now we're going to enter the first phase called attorney review. The attorney review period is to come to agreement on all terms and conditions, right? The buyer and the seller, the two parties. They need to come to agreement on all conditions. How do they do that? The attorneys are going to create a legal document. It's called a rider. Now, that legal document is going to have a lot of terms and, uh, you know, clauses on it. And uh, the buyer attorney is typically the one that sends it out first. So it's pretty generic. It's not going to be anything too, uh, um, too amazingly complex. It's just a lot of, you know, clauses uh, that they're making changes. Add this, modify this change the word usage on this. And that writer is gonna go back and forth between the two parties until they come to agreement on all terms and conditions. At that point, you will complete a attorney review when the final uh, writer, final response is executed by the opposing party. Okay. So that's attorney review. I mean, uh, were, there, were there multiple offers on this particular uh, property? Do you know? Uh, no, I don't, I don't believe so. It previously selected a buyer, but, um, it, it didn't, it just fell through. Okay. I think we just got in first. Okay. So it was just a, uh, it was a one-on-one. -on -one. I mm -hmm. would spend finishing attorney review quickly, uh, for one major reason, understand that any party can cancel for any reason while you're in attorney review, that includes the buyers, the sellers. Now, when it comes to buyers, there's probably about a dozen reasons why they would want to cancel Maybe they get cold feet, they're reconsidering the property. Maybe they saw another property, they could lose their jobs. You know, who knows, right? Um, mm -hmm. So you can cancel without penalty. All you have to do is, as a request from the attorney is send a, what's called a letter of cancellation, letter of termination. And that, so you can cancel. You don't even need a reason. You can just send it. And now any party can cancel. But there's only one good reason a seller might, might cancel on a buyer. Can you think of what may that be what reason uh, could possibly come up for a seller to cancel on a buyer they just don't want to sell they yeah, change their probably, mind probably but that's probably not it um what a, if a other offer comes in you got it so what if you were the seller and all of a sudden another offer comes in while you're attorney view and it's a higher it's a better it's a stronger offer what are you gonna do mm -hmm. right so that's yeah. That's a big reason why a seller might cancel. And in today's environment, it's not that abnormal. It happens a lot. Um, yeah. Speak to enough agents, they'll tell you they get kicked out of attorney review. So it's uh, it's pretty important to uh, to uh, to complete swiftly. How do you uh, complete attorney review very very quickly? Come to agreement quickly. 
it's through the, the attorney, the response time, everybody's response time. Now you have the buyer's response time, you have the attorney's response time, how quickly they can get together, form their response, send it over. It's the same thing with the sellers and their attorneys. So the back and forth, the quicker uh, it goes, the more likely you are to get the return of you very, very quickly. Now, let's just say it's very smooth. They come to agreement. You execute the, the they execute the rider. You complete attorney review. What happens next, right? That's generally I call it the inspection period. At this point, we'll uh, we'll you know, we'll have the buyers obtain a home inspector, schedule it. They'll conduct the home inspection and provide you a home inspection report. And once you receive the report, you're going to want to review that with your with your buyers to see if there's any items of concern on that report that they would like to request a seller address. I will tell you, this is where um, many transactions fall apart. If you can visualize like a mountain, the inspection is at the uh, is at the uh, very peak of the uh, of the mountain, and once you get past the inspection contingency, it's pretty much downhill from there. It's okay. just uh, you know this is where you know deals can either um, move forward or fall apart. So you, you definitely want to prepare them for what's about to happen. Uh, you want to communicate to them that uh, we're really looking to uh, request uh, items that are of major concern, not minor concern. You know, there's material items and there's nickel and diving. Those are those are two different things. You know, mm -hmm. we uh, it's something environmental or structural um, or a health issue or maybe even a mechanical issue, and it's considered a major issue. Those are the items that we want to uh, focus on, not so much the small stuff like. Uh, outlets that are not grounded and small cracks in the walkway and it doesn't I don't know, maybe it doesn't have a rain cap I don't know those are like you know small fixes that are you know like less than a few hundred dollars you don't want to focus necessarily on those now it could still be um a, actually it doesn't really go by price it could still be a clog in the drain yet it's, it's considered a, a major issue because the plumbing issue but it's only 200 dollars to fix you know mm -hmm. to make it so it, it depends on uh, what we're focusing on yet we're only focusing on the material the main main items you know we don't want to our goal is to arrive at the outcome they're looking for the buyers they like this home enough to spend an offer on it they're at this point they're probably already envisioning themselves living in the home with all their furniture and all their stuff and you know the last thing they want is probably to cancel so uh you don't want to um kind of have it fall apart over small stuff that everything's fixable, of course, right? So you just have to understand the situation that you're in. So just advise them best you can. Um, obviously, ultimately, they have to make the decision what they want to request. Yet I was saying that I like to tell my clients, it's, uh, you know, more is less, less is more. Um, mm -hmm. That means if you're asking for more things, you'll probably end up getting less. If you're asking for less things, you'll probably end up getting more. So let's, fo let's focus on, on the main items, the major items, the items that not and not only you, but any other buyer would be asking for. So when we're looking mm -hmm. at a particular uh, item, let's ask ourselves the question, is this an item that any other buyer would be asking for? Okay. All right, so my internet is back up and running. Let's see if I can get it back on my computer so you don't see me on such a small, narrow screen. And then we should be good. Uh, from a, uh, a comfort level on a scale of one to 10, how comfortable are you feeling right now considering this is your first transaction? <laughs> um, I am at like a seven just because I know I have so many people around me with uh, that can, are just so willing to help. Um, that That's giving me all the comfort. <laughs> And you should, they share that little bit of excitement in there that uh, translates as nervousness, but I'm grateful that I can reach out to, to a great team and, um, and get the help that I need. You're going to. Oh, you were muted. Yeah, yeah. No, no. I, uh, I have to shift it over my, to my laptop. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, hold on. Just fixing this. All right. Because I'm a host on the other one, it's a problem. <laughs> I got to keep this. <laughs> All right. 
All right, sorry about that. I'm having internet issues anyway. So, um, what would make you feel more comfortable? Um, I think just the experience. I think once uh, at the closing table, and I have a feel for every for every step as it goes along. I, I think that's what will help me feel more comfortable. Okay, so knowing what happens next, right? Mm -hmm. And if uh, you don't know what happens next and you can't figure it out on your own, you have people to go to? Right. All right, cool. That's it. <laughs> and it's okay to say, I don't know to your clients. So if they ask you a, a question, then it's okay to say, I don't know, or let me check, and, or I'll get back to you. That's, that's perfectly fine, right? Yes. You don't have to have the, all the answers. Okay. Very true. All right, awesome. Now, uh, your clients, um, they've been looking for a long time or not? We've been looking since uh, February, but then we took a bit of a pause uh, due to her pre-approval. So uh, I, I, she was working with an agent prior to me. I shown her maybe like 30 houses. Okay, that's a good amount and of homes. I, I I was shocked at how many houses we've seen. Okay. Well, is that is that usually how um is that you is that the usual ratio for like buyers? Listen, normally uh -huh. there's not even 30 houses to show. Um in most uh, in most areas and most price ranges. So the fact that you even got to that many homes is amazing in today's environment. Yet, yeah. did they submit any offers um, throughout or only when they got to the 30th home they, they submitted an offer? Um, we've submitted 11 offers. So you've submitted quite a few, just haven't been able to obtain. Yes. So the so here's, here's the, what I'm thinking. So the average agent in today's environment is their, their conversion issue from submitting an offer to getting an offer is in the range of um, five offers to an acceptance to 10 offers to an acceptance. It's somewhere okay. in that range. I think if, you, if I surveyed the uh, um, large amount of agents, it's probably closer to one out of 10. Okay. It really depends on your product, your price range and your skill level. So when we're, when we're, when we're discussing conversion and how many offers I need to submit in today's environment to get one accepted, it's probably closer to one out of 10. Now you, may have a higher um, conversion also depending on the factors, what kind of factors. Maybe they they have a low down payment. Maybe they need a seller concession. You know, so, so certain, certain things will um, factor into the conversion rates. Because right now, if you're coming in with low down payments, it does affect the strength of your offer. And the name of the game in today's environment is strength of offer. So if you're if you're being out getting beat out by cash offers and fifty percent down and thirty percent down twenty percent down and ten percent down, it'll factor into your conversion. So it just depends on the type of client you're working with too, and of course in what area. Now, I'll also share with you that um, if you submit enough offers, you'll get one accepted. It's a numbers game like anything else, <laughs> All right? And uh, obviously, uh, your clients are evidence of that. Eventually, you submit enough offers, you do get one accepted. You just have to keep trying, keep looking. So don't. Uh, so it's frustrating, yes, to be a buyer in today's environment. Yes, it's frustrating even to be a buyer's agent in today's environment because you know you, you're always submitting, you're showing, you're submitting, you're showing. You're submitting. It's like you're starting over and over and over again. Yet ultimately, you can get the job done. You just have to keep working, right? Right. Okay. Right. And you have to be okay with it as a buyer's agent. As a buyer, we have to be okay with the market conditions because it is what it is. Right. So now, okay, you've been able to obtain a home. Next, let's get them to the finish line. So there's um, there's things that we can do as buyer's agents to make sure they get to the finish line. A lot of it involves us preparing them for what happens next, right? Just like um, you want to, you'll feel more comfortable Right, we just spoke about it. You'll feel more comfortable if you knew what happens next in mm -hmm. the buying process. They're no different. If if they know what happens next, they'll feel a lot more comfortable too. So if if, if you can have a discussion with them, you know, uh, let them know. Hey, listen, we're awaiting the uh, executed agreement. This is what happens next. We're going to send it out to the attorneys. 
once the, the attorneys get it, that's, this is what happens next. Oh, the attorneys uh, got it. Now you're going to discuss the initial buyer rider with your attorney. Great. Oh, you've just uh, uh, had discussion, the initial the discussion and they're sending the rider out to the other side. Great. Now we're going to await a response from the other side. That's what happens next. All right. You, we just got the response from the seller, uh, from the seller's attorney, this is what happens next. You're gonna have another discussion and you're gonna respond to that. If everything looks good, you're going to actually sign that, execute that, and we're gonna complete attorney review. So always tell them what happens next so they feel more comfortable. So when we ask them on a, uh, on a scale of one to 10, how comfortable you are, that they feel as comfortable as, uh, as they possibly can. Now, I will tell you that there's naturally a level of anxiety and nervousness and whatever when buying a home, yet we can reduce that those levels of anxiety, frustration, um, just by sharing information with them. Right, okay. So that's what we can do to make sure it's a lot smoother of a transaction. We also, that's also things that we can do to make sure it gets the closing. Because things, it's, every transaction has its share of surprises. Every transaction, we just can't forecast what, uh, what issues arise. All right. right? You know, and just when you think you've seen it all, surprise. <laughs> So it's, uh, it's, it's a fun, fun occupation to be in because no transaction is the same. Uh, you're dealing with different personalities all the time and our days don't even look the same. So it's, right. uh, it's, uh, it's an interesting uh, line of work to be in. So uh, Ron, after the attorney review and after the inspection, um, if anything was to come up on the inspection, how, how do we handle that process? Okay, so there's several things going on simultaneously at this point. Okay. Just to understand the timelines. One uh, is your additional deposit. Let's talk about that for a second. Okay. The additional deposit, which is you know, usually about 5%, but if it's a lower down payment, then you'll put whatever you got. Uh, that's due 10 days after completion of attorney review. Okay. Okay. Now, normally, yeah, we're conducting our home inspections before the due date on the additional deposit. Yet, many, many times... Um, maybe the inspection contingency hasn't been agreed upon or the uh, inspection items, uh, we don't have an agreement on it, yet we're still submitting that additional deposit. Now, the clients typically, or many, many times, they have this follow-up question when we're talking about timelines, well, what happens to my deposit if we don't come to agreement on the inspection items? Well, it's a very pro-buyer process in New Jersey. If the buyer and the seller can't come to agreement on inspection contingency, on inspection items, the buyer can cancel without penalty. So if they've already provided their deposit, they get it back. If they haven't de provided their deposit yet and, you, uh, and you've re you know, um, arrived at um, a stalemate, then no harm, no foul, and you just cancel, right? But, okay. but just know that the buyers can cancel that penalty if the buyer and the seller can't come to agreement on inspection contingency items, all right? Okay. Uh, so yes, we're gonna get the report, the I'll always recommend that we have a discussion that I review with them. They don't know. They don't know what happens. They don't know what they're supposed to do. So what happens if we don't set the expectation of what happens next, they'll create their own expectation. That's also where surprises happen. So I always like to include in the buyer consultations a, a small script when it comes to inspection, uh, con, uh, pe inspection period, inspection contingency. Mr. And Mrs. Buyer, after you receive their inspection report, you and me, we're going to have a discussion uh, and we're going to make a list, create a list. Uh, I'm gonna help you create a list uh, of items of concern. You can put a number to it, three to five items, five to eight items. You, you wanna instill that in their head so that there's there's like a expectation. Oh, okay, we're gonna create a short list of items that are most important to us, not everything. I get it, okay, thank you. So we're setting that expectation early on and then we're gonna have to repeat ourselves before and after the inspections when the inspection report comes in and we're not necessarily, um, you know, we're not gonna write it in the center of the attorney, but we're gonna have a discussion. We're gonna review the report with them together. And you know what, you might wanna consider doing this. You might wanna consider um, requesting that. And then of course you can add, modify, delete um, anything that we're, uh, we're talking and then you're gonna send that list over to the attorney. Sounds good, great, wonderful. And you're good, right? Okay. Uh, I have a question about that, yeah. Ron. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so after we're in attorney review, when it comes to, to the inspections and, and just us uh, communicating uh, about it, 
do we just communicate straight with our uh, attorney and they'll communicate with the other attorney and then they'll let the agent know? Or am I contacting the agent directly? So, you know, it depends on the relationship you have with the agent, but giving a heads up to the other agent of what's coming, it goes back to the same discussion we had. If the other agent knows what's coming, they can also, um, you know, prepare themselves and their clients um, for what's coming and then uh, go from there as well. So, you know, it's always good to have an open line of communication. The more, uh, you know, the, the higher level of communication you have with the opposing agent, with the other agent, with the listing agent, it's always going to benefit, um, you know, you and the buyers and to make sure that uh, we're getting it to the, uh, to, the, to the closing table. Okay. Um, you know, n- not that if you had no communication and the, the buyer attorney just send the list to the seller attorney, that would be the end of the world. Uh, obviously, it's not. I think the many, many communications are just like that. But if you know what, what's being sent, you, you know, I think they'd appreciate it if you can, uh, if, if it was communicated to them. Hey, listen, Mr. or Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Listing Agent, we're, we're just going to be asking for a termite treatment, uh, mold remediation, and for you to fasten the deck. It wasn't attached to the house. The, those are the most major uh, items of concern, and those are the only things they're requesting. Or... Hey, listen, I mean, I tried to talk them out of it, but they're sending the whole, uh, you know, a laundry list of items. Do me a favor. Just say yes, yes, no, no. Don't get shocked by it. Um, and then we'll go from there. We'll, we'll make it work. You know, you want to, you want to set the expectation always. Um, so there's no, so there's no surprises because when, you know, when, you know, when, when people are frustrated and it doesn't matter who it is, we're dealing with a lot of personalities in a transaction and it could be the buyers. And of course, sometimes there's partners and spouses, right? They're, they're, it's, it's a couple, or maybe it's a, fa- a family of four that's buying a house together. You're dealing with a lot of personalities. And then of course there's the buyer's agent. And then of course there's the buyer's attorney. Oh, wait a minute, but there's also the seller's attorney. And there's also the sellers, which may be one, two, three, six people. We don't, uh, it, it, it varies. And then of course you have the listing agent and maybe they have a co-listing agent. And there's a lot of personalities that we have to deal with in a transaction and the higher level of communication you have with everybody, I think it just helps things move along uh, in a smooth manner. So it's, it's, it's always a benefit to everybody. I think when, when you're having those difficult conversations, the, the, the easy conversations are easy. <laughs> the difficult conversations are the ones that we really need to have, even when we don't feel like having. It, it helps us. So the better you are at having those difficult conversations, the more um, you know. The more you're, the more likely you're actually going to make it at the closing table. Okay. So to Will answer, you- to simplify, yes, mm-hmm. you know, if uh, you can give the other agent a heads up, it always helps. Okay. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Um, sorry. It's okay, but uh, let's go back to the uh, to the inspection contingency for a second. So mm-hmm. they did the back and forth, right? We uh, we came to agreement on inspection items. What's next? We're gonna we're, we're getting towards the the stretch here. Um, the f- last thing to do is really obtain the mortgage commitment and uh, submit all the conditions uh, to the lender and get the closing. But how do we get there? So the, after you complete the inspection contingency, typically that's when you'll order the appraisal. That's when the appraisal gets ordered. So you're, you're the lender, the buyer's lender would order the appraisal. The appraisal appraiser will then, will then reach out to you. You'll schedule the meeting for the uh, appraisal. He'll come out, he'll, he'll conduct the appraisal. He'll provide the appraisal report to the lender directly. You won't, they won't CC you or anything like that. The, the lender gets it, everything looks good. Your lender's underwriter will usually at this point review your whole uh, your buyer's file and they'll provide your buyers with what's called a mortgage commitment letter on that mortgage commitment letter it's going to be a list of conditions uh, your buyers will go to work on submitting those conditions as soon as they've submitted everything and you're within uh, 10 days of the uh, targeted closing date uh, that's when they'll send it to clear to close department and um, you know, once you uh, get those magic words clear to close, that's when your buyers can sit, schedule the closing day and time with their attorney. Now, buyers, agents, we have questions around closing dates. These I call them target closing dates because the majority of them don't close on the actual target date. Now, mm. 
the one concern for a buyer is what? If it doesn't close on time, there's something called an interest rate lock. What's it called? An interest rate lock. Okay. Once you receive your executed agreement, they're going to send a copy to their lender. Their lender will lock in their interest rate. But they won't lock it in forever. They're going to lock it in for you know, 30, 40, 45, 60, 75 days, whatever it may be. They're going to lock it in. If your uh, interest rate lock uh, expires, you pass the date, the expiration date, now what? It's going to cost them money to extend the interest rate lock. That's why the, um, you know, the lenders typically buffer it a few days. They give you a couple extra days you know, past the closing date because if there is an issue, it doesn't affect, uh, it doesn't affect the, uh, the interest rate. You don't want it to expire, and you also don't want to pay extra money to extend the interest rate lock. So that's why when um, you know, transactions are running late for one reason or another, you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, the buyers get a little bit of upset or distraught or frustrated with the fact that they got to shell out more money and there's, uh, you know, there's really nothing they can do about it. Right. So you want to discover uh, what that interest rate lock date is and the expiration date is. So everybody's on the same page. And, um, you know, there's a few reasons why transactions tend to not close on time. Um, yeah, you know, a major one is actually obtaining the CCOs or the COs from the, from the towns. That, of course, the seller responsibility or uh, listing agents, they help a lot and on many occasions when it comes to the COs as well. Uh, so a lot of times that's late. Maybe they failed three times and, you know, they can't, they can't uh, schedule a reinspection date and we're past the closing date and the lender won't let you escrow and because maybe it was a new construction. And so it's, I don't know, there's, there's all kinds of moving parts all the time, but uh, you just want to be on top of everybody and everything. Make sure that the listing agent and the seller have obtained the CO and you're good to go on that end. Uh, title binders, you know, if they're not in, they, they, they delay transactions. Uh, the, the appraisal report, even though it's more of a mid-transaction, they do delay transactions. Um, so, you know, you want to get the um, appraisal report back uh, as soon, the sooner the better. Why? Because Many, many lender underwriters, they'll only review the files and provide you a mortgage cover letter after they receive their appraisal report, unless they've already pushed it ahead and you'll receive that mortgage commitment letter with the appraisal as a uh, condition. Then you're already a little bit ahead of the game. So it's, um, you know, the appraisal dictates the pace of the transaction on many occasions. Okay. So those are the, some of the reasons why that a transaction may be delayed. Um, obviously, there's there's a hundred others, but uh, they're usually a smaller instant, you know, smaller, uh, more, less likely to occur. Now, as far as the title binders, can uh, what is that? Can you tell me more about that? Sure. So the uh, your buyer attorney will order what's called a title binder. So um, obviously, attorneys typically have title companies that they have relationships with that they like to work with. Mm -hmm. We have a particular one and, uh, you know, Bergen County Partners, uh, Carnegie Title does an amazing job for us. So we're always recommending that uh, our clients work with them and our attorneys work with them. And, uh, you know, th they're going to make sure that there's no, uh, they're going to do a title search. They're going to do a flood search. Uh, that's going to be part of the title binder. Uh, and, uh, you know, just to make sure you, your clients get clear title. We, uh, the last thing you want is to show up right before the closing table um, and discover that there's a, I don't know, a $10,000 lien on the house and the seller doesn't want to close until they resolve it because it shouldn't be there, you know, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it could be various things, but we're just making sure that they get clear title and um, it's not all of a sudden in a uh, flood hazard zone, in a flood plain. Okay. And um, <clears throat> at what point during the transaction um, do, does the, do we reach out to the, does, does the, sorry, does the attorney reach out to the title uh, company? Gen generally when they go under contract, when, uh, so once you complete attorney review, now you're considered to be under contract. At that point, they'll order the uh, title binder from the uh, title company. Okay.
And people, there's a lot of people that are involved in a transaction, uh, right? Yeah. So the, of course, there's, you know, on the buy side, the, of course, there's the buyers and the buyer's agent and the attorney and the inspector and the lender and the appraiser and oil tank sweeps and uh, chimney sweeps, uh, you know, chimney inspections and, uh, you know, sewer line inspections. And uh, that's, of course, if they you know, decide, if they opt to, to do those things. So that, you know, there's a lot of, people that are involved and sometimes the uh, they can also um, not do what they're supposed to do when they're supposed to do it, right? Um, you know, it's possible that some attorneys, they miss certain dates and, mm -hmm. you know, they don't pay attention to the deposit date or they don't pay attention to the closing date or they don't pay attention to this, this or that. So you, know, you, have, you really have to be on top of everybody and everything if you want to make sure you have a smooth transaction. Okay. Um, and you mentioned a few inspections. Are there any, which ones do you recommend for your for home each inspector? House? So mm -hmm. you, the general home inspectors, they'll do a home inspection that will include usually radon and termite inspections. Mm -hmm. So that's usually in your uh, general. Now they'll inspect the property, you know, top to bottom, side to side, all the visible areas. And many of them don't necessarily do oil tank sweeps, which is uh, an additional one that the attorneys always recommend. Uh, in Bergen County, in our area, even Passaic County and other, uh, and other counties in New Jersey, many of the heat, original heat sources on these homes were oil. And when they were converted to gas, many of the homeowners, they left the tanks in the ground. So now all of a sudden they're abandoned tanks, yet the properties have switched hands once, twice, three times, several times since. And, you know, the newer sellers, they won't necessarily know if there's an abandoned tank or not unless they've done a sweep of their own. So for peace of mind's sake, just to make sure that you don't get, uh, you don't inherit an, an abandoned oil tank, you're going to conduct an oil tank sweep, which ranges anywhere from 150 to 250 usually, mm -hmm. uh, depending on the company. It's just to give you uh, your clients peace of mind. They did the sweep. They didn't find a tank. If they do find an abandoned tank on the on the premises, then it's it's typically already written in the writers. The sellers will be responsible for removal and remediation if needed. So I call it a non-issue for the buyers. It does kind of throw a twist into into everything. Yet um, you know ultimately it'll be handled and taken care of, and uh, the buyers. I call it a non-issue for buyers because they're not going to have to be responsible for it. So as long as they're patient. Um, we'll still get to the closing title, uh, to the closing, and without uh, without an oil tank in the ground, and, and it'll be fine. Okay. Okay, so you recommend the general inspection and then an oil tank sweep. Right. So uh -huh. now the additional inspections that are conducted by many buyers um, is a level to chimney inspection. Mm. Which one? A chimney inspection. Oh, Okay. So that's done quite often uh, by buyers. And then, of course, uh, the uh, sewer line inspection. And uh, I'm not so familiar about the sewer line inspection. What it, um... So they'll go in. A lot of them have cameras. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they'll, uh, they'll put a camera in there and they'll uh, make sure that there's no defects. There's no clogs. There's no breaks. Okay. Everything's okay. Okay. They're generally 350 to 400 somewhere in that range, uh, the sewer line inspections. Of course, it depends on the company that does it. Awesome. Is there anything else that you feel I should know about this process? <laughs> I mean, uh, it depends on the area that you're doing. Um, you know, many areas, they don't have any radon issues and some do. And sometimes you're running into areas that have septic and well, so there's additional inspections for those. You'll have, obviously, if there's a septic, uh, instead of a municip municipal sewer, then you'll conduct a, you know, an inspection for the septic. And so it just depends on, you know, the different, uh, the, the product or the scenario that you're walking into. For the most part, I'm just simplifying I like to simplify things for clients. I like to simplify things for other people so they can easily remember it. The buying process is made up of three phases, the attorney review, the inspection period, the mortgage contingency period. You, you go from one to the other until you, get, uh, until you get to the closing, you become a homeowner. Now, when we simplify things, it, it becomes less overwhelming and it's e easier to remember. All right. <laughs>
it's a very pro buyer process um, in general. Once you get into it, uh, it's a very difficult environment to obtain a home. So once a, a buyer obtains a property that they like enough to live in it, you know, then that's something to be excited about. And especially in, to, in, you know, in today's market, which is a very strong seller's market with a lot of competition where we're submitting a lot of offers in order to obtain. So, you know, we're willing to, from a buyer standpoint, they should be willing, in my eyes at least, they should be willing to give up um, or look the other way if there's, um, you know, some small things that might get in the way. Anything that's fixable, everything's fixable, but anything that's like a small issue that's easily fixable shouldn't prevent you from getting to the closing table. Okay. In my eyes, but uh, you know, listen, you know, people sometimes uh, they make decisions based on ego or principle or whatever, and things fall apart over a hundred dollars. So it's uh, it, which is unfortunate, <laughs> but it uh, it does happen. Oh boy. Yeah. Yeah, I can't t- tell you one thing that I know for sure that after you go through the experience of one transaction, you will feel a lot more confident moving forward. <laughs> that's what i'm aiming for <laughs> so the experience itself is uh training right it really is and it's, it's, it, and, yeah and it's the best type right because right. it, it'll it'll make you better it'll make you a better agent right and so how what's your strategy to follow up with all these different characters that play a role in the in the process do you have like a system in place where you just uh, make like a, a time block or specific day or uh, well, when, when it comes to the buyers just every conversation you have just tell them what happens next and okay. that's on the buyer end and then when it comes to you know the uh, the other um, I guess personalities or uh, the other people in the transaction if they're doing their job I don't need to follow uh, follow up too much with them I don't need to remind them be on top of them too much so if the attorney is doing everything they should be doing in a timely manner, I'm CC'd on all the uh, uh, communications. I don't necessarily have to bug them. What's the latest? What's, uh, give me an update on this. Give me an update on that. So if they're, that's also why it's important to make recommendations, why you're recommending the right people. Because if you know that they're going to do their job like they're supposed to, then you don't have to be on top of them as much. And it doesn't matter if it's the lender, the inspector, or the attorney. That's why we're, um, you know, not all our attorneys are created equal, just like all real estate agents are created equal. Not all lenders are created equal and not all inspectors are created equal. Some are just better than others, especially in today's market conditions. Okay. So, you know, you know, via experience, we're going to know who to recommend. Or if you don't know, your office actually has a recommended list of vendors mm-hmm. for all, for anything that a, a buyer or seller might need throughout the transaction. So we can always... Uh, obtain that from our uh, market center's websites. Uh, they sh- it should be uploaded to, uh, to those sites. Okay. Awesome. You know what the most um, stressful thing about a closing is? Oh boy, what is it? The most stressful thing about a closing is replacing it in your pipeline. Because <laughs> to keep, in order to stay, I guess, or achieve your goals or have success and longevity in this business, you always have to have a pipeline. Always. Right. And so because if you don't have a pending pipeline, you won't have a sold pipeline. And if you don't have a sold pipeline, then what are you what are we doing? We're not making it there's no income. Right. So you know if this is work, if this is a uh, a career that we've selected for ourselves, we need to have transactions in order to have income. That's how it works, right? It's a commission-based job. So you have to have a pending pipeline in order to have souls. And you also have to have a lead pipeline in order to have pendings. Because you can't have a pending if you don't have leads to work on. It's always important to keep all of those pipelines full. One affects the other. Um, one last question, Ron. How do you limit the, I know the market's a little intense right now, but how do you limit um, the amount of houses you show to a, a buyer um, within a regular market? Well, that's, if such a thing? <laughs> so there is, let's just theoretically say it's a neutral market or it's a buyer's market even. 
Um, there is a way to increase sense of urgency. Um, and it all starts with setting expectations. Yet on top of that, it also involves skill level. So communicating that an expertise goes a long way in how many homes you end up showing. So when you set the expectation, you know, this is what an average, this is the average amount of homes that a buyer will look at before submitting an offer. All right, so we're setting that expectation, yet also via discovering what they're looking for, via you know, the needs analysis and the pre-qualification and all that fun stuff, we're obtaining information so that we don't have to show them a lot of homes. Now, it's our job to know the inventory. So one of the value propositions that I um, communicate to my buyers throughout, whether it doesn't matter when the conversation is, whether it be the pre-qualification or the buyer consultation or at any point in time, one of the value propositions is um, I'm going to see homes before you do. I'm going to see the inventory before you do. Now, if I know what they're looking for, I don't need them to see a lot of homes. I have a special ability. I, don't, I can direct them. I can say, go see these three homes because it has ABC. Or you know what, Mr. and Mrs. Byer, you don't need to see these homes because of XYZ. Mm-hmm. But that we can only um, do that if one, we've discovered what they're looking for. We've done a really good job on our needs analysis. And uh, if we actually go out and see the inventory. Mm, wow, okay. So that, that's how we can develop or create sense of urgency in a neutral market or a buyer's market so that we don't have to show them 50 homes. Okay. When we get there, we're not, we're obviously not even close to being there. We're probably years away from, from, from those type of scenarios in our areas, but it's, uh, eventually it will come around just like it always does. Okay. <laughs> yeah. It's a different skill set. You know, we, we always have to, um, work on developing our skills, yet our skills, different skills are needed in different markets. Expertise, I, I would say is needed in any market. It doesn't matter what the, the market is like we should always be viewing the inventory so and it's always easier to start where we live because it's of the proximity to the inventory mm-hmm. so and, and the majority of towns don't have a lot of inventory like the the most inventory i've seen in a town lately is probably like 70 homes which is a lot but you can probably see it in a few weeks yet the majority of towns have what six eight twelve twenty homes there's not a lot of inventory to actually go see so if you're in, if, let's just say in the surrounding area where you live, you go see five to 10 a week. You're going to see the inventory in two weeks. Mm-hmm. You just have to go see some homes. Then you're, you'll be an expert in the inventory. Now, being an expert in your local market takes a little bit more time, but it's not as intensive as you might think. Because after you see the initial inventory, let's just say there's only 12 homes in your neck of the woods, Fine, you've seen them all. How many homes are actually added every single week? Two homes, three homes, five homes. You you don't you know every single week you're only seeing a handful of homes, not that many. And over time, what happens is you develop expertise in that local market. You have a, a greater understanding of what's going on than your uh, more so than your traditional agent in that local market. So all you have to do is go see some homes over a period of time if you're looking to be uh, an expert at a very high level. Okay. And, and what are some of the things that you need to uh, become familiar with in order to become a local expert? Well, it, you know, it's, uh, I can ask questions. Well, do you know how many active homes are on the market now in your, in your area? If you don't know them, go check. You know, it doesn't take that long, right? And if I say, okay, well, how many under contract? What's the population size of your local market? How many households are there? How many schools are there? Are you familiar with how many elementary schools, middle schools, and high schools there are? Right. Um, so it's it's quite it, where is the nearest uh, transportation? These are questions that people ask all the time. Where's the nearest bus to the city? Where's the nearest train? Mm-hmm. Where are the parks? What's the best pizza place? It's just, you know, get familiar with your uh, with your town. Um, get familiar with the, uh, you know, the map, with the with the streets, with the locations of everything. And that will provide, you know, that'll, that'll help provide, communicate, convey expertise to our clients. Okay. See, if I know all that information and I don't have to go look it up and, you know, we're having a conversation, they can tell that you're an expert in the area 
without you saying you're an expert. Right. You don't have to say I'm an expert in this area. They'll know just by you communicating the information to them. But of course, we have to go out and we have to educate ourselves first. We, you can't give what you don't have. Right. Right. You, you can't give information you don't have. You can't um, uh, communicate the buying process if you don't know the buying process. You can't communicate how to strengthen an offer in multiple offer situations if you don't know. You can't communicate with the market conditions like if you don't know. You can't give what you don't have. That's why we have to always prepare, learn, grow, um, develop ourselves uh, when we're not with clients so that we can better service them when the opportunity presents itself. You know, whether it be a, a listing or a buyer or renter or investor or whatever it may be. Awesome. Thank you, Ron. <laughs> My pleasure. I mean, we're towards the end here. Um, any last questions? Um, not as of yet, but I'm sure something will come up. <laughs> oh, listen, you can always call me. You can always text me, email me. Um, I'm always available to you. So just, uh, you know, if you think of something and you uh, you can't discover the answer on your own, just give me a ring. I really appreciate that. This was really helpful. My pleasure. That's the goal. All right. Thanks for joining me. Thank Have you. Have a great day. Enjoy your day. Thank you. Bye.